my talk is about red hair, which hopefully you can sort of get a clue as to why it's a special interest of mine. And if not, I've put this lovely childhood photo there to try and give you an idea about it. Um, so I like to, I thought this photo sort of captured what it was like uh, to be the redhead that I am with my dark haired, dark eyed brother with who tans easily sort of looking at me. I sort of imagine in that sort of strange way of who is this redheaded creature? Or maybe he was thinking perhaps, um, why didn't mum have your hair cut? Or maybe thinking, why is it mum's job to have your hair cut? But whichever way, it sort of captures the, the childhood ginger that I was. Um, and when you have something distinctive as a child and something that people see straight away, it becomes a great part of your identity without you even realizing it. So as you go on, you look around yourselves. My whole family has dark hair and dark eyes apart from myself. So looking for other gingers was an important thing for me. So there are quite a few gingers around um, in the past and the present. So you see them, you know, some of them are more interesting than others. And so in that time, you're finding your way for your meaning. At the same time, um, anyone else that is in the audience that's ginger as well will have probably experienced the compliments and the insults um, in probably in fairly equal measures, but um, not, I could probably list a huge amount of um, names that I've been called over the time and also little old ladies that have stopped me and when I was little wanted to stroke my hair in sort of strange ways, sometimes slightly disconcertingly. So all of these things build up to give you an idea of who you are and you can't help but stand out in the crowd. You'd be noticed in a classroom if you're in the sort of one or two ginger children that are there. So through all this time, I found this idea of my identity as a teenager. I you know, got used to some of the insults and the slightly risque comments continually. And the lovely teenage boy that used to follow my walk to school on the bus and sing the Jasper Carrot theme tune to me every day. So it was quite hard to forget that I was a ginger. So as I got older, I started to reflect a little bit more on it and it became a little bit of a specialist subject of mine. So I'm going to share that joy with you. So as a start, you kind of think about why, why is hair important? Um, and, you know, I got pointed out so much as a child as to, you know, what it was. And when you think about it, actually, as a human race, we have a huge preoccupation with hair. It's something that comes up all the time. Um, so hair is found on almost all mammals and all healthy humans will grow hair. Obviously that's, I know that there might be some people that are watching that have lost some of that hair as you've got older, but as you, when you're young, you should be able to grow hair. And it's underpin, underpinned so many things about human belief and everyday life. Um, and also because hair color is very much linked to initial to location and to race. Um, it's quite, it can be, become part of um, discrimination and stereotypes. Um, and certainly that's been in the news more recently as well. Um, there's lots of beliefs about hair and we, I'm gonna explain a few of those things with you. So red hair itself is a significant minority. So one to 2% of the world's population has red hair. Um, the, British Isles has a higher percentage than that. Um, so it, the British Isles has sort of, I think about 4% um, and in with big pockets in um, Ireland and in Scotland. So it's got those sort of Celtic links. Um, the red hair is caused by a mutation in 1996. It, the genes that make red hair were discovered and this mutation is found in other animals with the colouring. So all redheads actually have something in common with foxes, ginger mice and so on. It's a shared identity that we can li link together. And at the same time, and, and it's quite unusual, I think in genes, please don't ask me questions about the science part of this. This is not my specialism, but I think the fact that you have this link as well with um, low levels of pigment, so pale skin that comes often with the red hair as well is um, unusual. So it's genetically recessive, making it even more unusual in areas with dominant darker colored hair. And obviously as we um, have moved around so much, it means that redheads, some people say that we're endangered because there's so much more, so many more dark haired um, people around. So, you know, I think redheads have a responsibility perhaps to get out there and spread their genes around a little bit more. Okay, so, 
If we go on to here, obviously when something is different, it can often lead to people being somewhat scared. Um, and there's quite a lot of examples in history where red hair was seen as something to be feared. Um, the ancient Egyptians did worship um, rather scary God <laughs> by burning red haired, red -haired um, sacrifices. Um, the ancient Greeks feared red hair. They felt that people's humours were out of line and they believed that when redheads died, they turned into vampires. So, so easy, big fears to be there. And the Polish folklore have the wild women that have hairy bodies and, um, and these hearts that, and they were capable of eating little boys. Um, Brahmin, in, Brahmins were told not to marry women with red hair in their guidelines. And redheads were seen as unlucky. Um, there were, there's quite a lot of superstitions, um, things like you need to spit when you pass a redhead. Don't, you know, at New Year's, you don't want to open your door to find a redhead because you're going to be unlucky for the rest of the year. Um, and all of these things have sort of pervaded through time. And obviously, I think I'm assuming most of these might be surprising to people. And I hope so. So I haven't much as I've had abuse, I haven't had people spitting around me or as far as I've known. I mean, maybe they walked past and I didn't notice, but um, most of these things are there, but actually we still have the echoes of them, I think, through time now. Um, and a lot of those things came on from religion. So specifically in this country, you can see that there's an idea about redhead in Christianity. Um, it starts really within the top corner there where you've got the devil. And so if we're looking at, if you know anything with colour theory, which don't ask me questions on because I'm not sure that I do particularly know loads about it, but red has got lots of connotations and one of those is of the devil. So straight away, um, when you're looking at representations of things in a religious way, the red hair became associated with perhaps not the nice people in the Bible. So, um, one of the most famous ones is Judas, who um, since the ninth century has been depicted as a redhead. Um, uh, even in some cases, there's, there are photos where he turns into a red, redhead as he betrays Jesus. So this sort of idea that you become untrustworthy and that I'll refer back to that later. Um, and obviously the big picture at the top is Eve. Um, she's usually depicted as a redhead. This is a, that's from St, the St Paul's Cathedral um, mosaics, the big picture there with the um, tigers. And in fact, as in pictures, as she commits that sin, that first sin of taking the apple, her hair becomes bright red. Um, and in the Sistine Chapel, it's the same thing. So at that the redness becomes more at sin when in relation to the sin. There's also Cain and Abel. Um, Cain is very often depicted as a redhead. Um, that might potentially have come a little bit later, but if you look, and also Mary Magdalene, Magdalene who's also there. Um, and there's some other connotations with her, which I will refer to a little bit later on, um, but she's often depicted in pictures as having red hair. So you've got this sort of idea through the Bible. There are another, there's a few more redheads. So like David was, but he's a little, you know, he's got his moments of not being great as well. So. But the majority of the people that have been depicted as redheads are the not nice characters in the Bible, to say the least. Um, and this hatred has actually led through even more into it's like uh, racial cultural profiling. Um, and specifically, um, the red hair has been used through those times to then represent Jews. Um, and yeah, so the, this has been, this was used in um, the Shylock character in Merchant of Venice, where um, traditionally, I think this has now stopped, but it was for a very long time, Shylock wore a ginger wig, and that was used to um, represent Jews. But this was like a shorthand anyway at that time um, for uh, Jewish characters. In, at the time when Shakespeare was writing, the Jews had been driven out of um, of London so most people hadn't come in contact with Jews so it became like a shorthand they would put people put make Jewish um, characters wear a wig and then if you actually look um, further on this the, and actually this had some sort of roots in morality plays where um, the redheads were sort of seen as Jewish and then therefore diabolical and soldiers of the Antichrist um, and then we get this this link back again to the devil um, 
So Dickens then carries this on. So we've got the character of Fagin, um, Jewish, ginger in the description. Um, and Dickens also isn't very complimentary about Uriah Heep, who has hardly any eyebrows and um, no eyelashes, but that, that's not perhaps the Jewish link to it. But you can see that these ideas have been perpetuated through and um, this hatred kind of has, la has led on from there. So if we think about hair stereotyping, um, most of us know these, you know, there's about a million jokes about it. I think the blondes have had a fairly hard time in terms of the jokes, um, but there are assumptions that are made about people from their colors of their hair. So, um, so when you're thinking about it, there, there's been lots of research done and people make lots of um, assumptions. There was a research project done in the 70s, which basically said that um, blondes were the, were the most attractive, redheads were the least attractive. Um, and when they were showing images to people, there were lots of assumptions that were made and it's carried on since then. Um, so I was gonna refer particularly to this text, which is, um, labeling theory and the stigmatization of red hair by Heckett and Best. And they use labeling theory to discuss the kind of roles that redheads well, are known to have. Um, so these include the hot temper, which if you're a redhead, you get used on you all the time. You can't so much as scowl at someone without them blaming you, blaming your hair for it. Um, clownish, weirdness. Well, when you're unusual, I guess, you know, if you're in the minority, I guess that weirdness is there anyway. Irishness. Um, I have had someone run through a Japanese bar to, they were Irish themselves though, to think that they might have met their kindred spirit from home. Sadly, I had to disappoint them, but I've, had, I've been mistaken many times for being Irish. Um, I mean, I think they're not capable of, not capable of being in the sun. I'm, I mean, actually that's true, is it not? Um, you know, I've spent my life wearing hats. I mean, my mum had this freakish ginger haired baby. I spent lots of time being completely covered in sun cream. And to be fair to my mum, when I didn't have sun cream on, I've had proper scale, full scale burns from being in the sun. So I'm not sure that's a stereotype. I think that might just be a fact, to be honest with you. Um, wild women, wimpy men and intellectual su superiority. I'm not too sure about that one either. I've not come across that one so much. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these stereotypes. So obviously the hot temper is something that has come straight up. Some people say that this has got roots in the Romans and their first contact with red hair, which was in, in large numbers, which was when they came to the UK and they um, obviously met Boudicca, who was a bit of a surprise to them, this female warrior. And obviously she didn't win, but she did give the Romans a bit of a run for their money. Also, the Picts in Scotland, who the Romans never really took on, it, it played into their, um, to their stereotype to be able to justify perhaps the reason why they never made it. Um, and all of these proverbs, I mean, I think this is probably the most pervading still idea about red hair. Um, and it, some people say it also fits in with some kind of long-term hatred of the Irish in the UK, that there was this sort of idea about the bad temper. Um, and, but it is in other countries as well. So in France, there's a proverb that says redheaded women are either violent or false, and usually they're both. Um, and so this idea of falsehood as well and not being trustworthy also kind of comes into it. Aristotle says the reddish are bad of character, think of the fox. And you've got this idea of foxes, particularly that comes through that, you know, you can't trust people that have, have got red hair. And Shakespeare uses it himself um, in his plays, this idea of a dissembling colour that you can't trust. Um, so another stereotype is redheaded men as wimps. Um, this is something I think perhaps we've seen. I think if you Google nerd, you will get some ginger head people with glasses because it's kind of a, a long running kind of idea, stereotype um, that comes up um, again and again. It, in the um, study in 1986, where they looked at um, people, redheaded men were seen as the weakest and the most feminine. And this kind of is still there in, I've put a few cultural references that are more recent, but it's still there um, for redheaded boys and men. Um, and you had the whole South Park um, kick a ginger day 
controversy where it became, you know, like you, you need to bully these sort of redheaded characters, redheaded people, redheaded children. It's sort of that sort of vulnerability. Um, and it's still around, it's, but I will come back to why when I studied this, so this is an old subject for me, and this was very, very prevalent in about 10, 15 years ago. And I'll talk a little bit about how maybe that has changed a little bit more recently. Um, so the other thing is redheaded clowns. Um, the ancient Greeks used red wigs to denote the clown or the fool, and that kind of has carried through in culture. There's a lot of those redheaded clowns, and you know, obviously Ronald McDonald is worldwide there with his bright red hair, but you've also got Bozo the Clown and more recent things. I've never watched the Ginger Clown film. I just found it on Google, but there you go. It's scary and redheaded fits into many of those stereotypes. I don't know, it doesn't look particularly funny though, so maybe not the, quite the clown idea. Um, and another um, stereotype that there is, is of red-headed women as wild and promiscuous. So if we come back to that idea of color theory, you've also got this idea of red that pervades everything. You've got the red light district, um, prostitution, and those kind of things are all rooted with this color of red. Um, and it feeds in a bit more, so you've still got this idea of hair. Some people say that because hair is something that grows in puberty as well, that you've got this sort of sexual connotation to hair. And then when you feed into that with this idea of red, it doesn't help. In the 19th century, red-headed children, you know, if you had a red-headed child, you weren't just filled with delight because it was seen, if you had a red-headed child, that the mother had had an affair with the devil or that they had had sex while the woman had her period, which showed a lack of self-control. And therefore this idea of um, redheaded women being sort of prostitutes or um, loose women was sort of fed into it. So you've got this Nell Gwynn character, she was redheaded. Um, and there are some cultures where prostitutes would wear red, um, red clothing, red, red wigs, dye their hair red because it, all of this stuff fed into this idea that women were wild and promiscuous if they had red hair. Okay. Um, this is probably the stereotype that I think is sort of prevalent the most in culture. Um, that, um, and this idea of red hair is weird and magical in particular. Um, there are an awful lot of sources where you've got this idea of redheads is weird. Um, but I think by the nature of it, you know, you, your redheads are in such a minority that you're going to have this idea that they might be an outsider and they might be a bit different. And then it's become kind of a cultural shorthand. You might notice characters now if you watch things on the telly that if you want someone to be a little bit odd or a bit interesting, it's not necessarily a negative thing, but the, they will, those characters will often be redheaded in books, particularly, but also on films. So it's kind of like a shorthand really for someone to maybe have to be a bit otherly, have something more about them. Um, and obviously a lot of this is rooted in witches. So you're looking, this is another thing that you go, can go back through the centuries. So um, witches, what people with red hair were seen as being witches and they were tortured and shaved and killed. And in the Spanish Inquisition, they were thought to have stolen hell's fire and need to be burnt. So, you know, steal a fire and then you get turned into fire. Um, also within this idea, you've got mythical creatures. So you have leprechauns and pixies that have uh, traditionally have red hair. You can find, you know, more obviously leprechauns, but also pixies. If you find pictures of them, particularly in the past, they would have had red hair as well. So you've got this kind of image all the way through. And ch child of corn, um, this sort of idea of slightly scary or strange beings. Um, and it's this, we, it, this is rooted all the way through, but I think, once you start looking for it in culture, you will find there's a lot more examples of that, um, particularly in things for children, which is what I originally studied this for. So in, if you're thinking about red hair, it has, it's definitely something that has flip-flopped in and out of fashion. So there's been different perceptions of it. So although you've got these long-term trends and stereotypes, and some of which are pretty negative and some of which are pretty positive, um, in terms of fashion, it, they, it has sort of flip-flopped around. So obviously a lot of that is linked to um, important figures. So if you go back in history, you've got like when Elizabeth I was queen, red hair became fashionable again. 
um, when Oliver Cromwell was um, Lord Protector, that then it became fashionable again. Um, so yeah, so we got the red, in fact, there's quite a few redheads in the royal family. And I know people talk about Prince Harry, um, but there, and it could, you know, there is that potential, but actually he could very easily have recessive redhead genes because there's an awful lot of gingers that go through the royal family. So, and obviously because the royal family have got a position of power, um, when we will reflect that so you know the, the masses will be encouraged to like hair at those points um and then we have this big point with the renaissance when um titian and the red hair became a very big thing um in a survey of 122 post-raphaelite paintings 63.1 percent of the women had red hair and if you were looking at paintings where the woman was the main character it was 79.2 percent of the women so you had this massive push where redhead, redheaded women were put into art. Potentially, maybe, because actually getting, that, the, getting the right colours and being able to mix them was quite a novel thing. So, it, and also it's an easier balance on a page to have a different colour. Um, but hopefully as well, it, may, it was because red hair was on its up and it was people were seeing it in a more positive light. Um, so, then you had a sort of a bit it darkened down for a while, particularly we got, you know, if you look at sort of Victorian periods when it was sort of um, a bit more slayed and everyone was quite controlled, these all these sort of things about witches and promiscuity perhaps were not things that people were wanting. So therefore it kind of died out a bit, but it had another big massive renaissance when colour film came in, because suddenly it was a really interesting thing to see. And so there was a huge push with um, film stars at that time, particularly female film stars that um, had red hair. So that you then had this sort of renaissance when it was good. Then probably when I was coming in, you were in a bit of a dark land again, um, particularly for ginger males, which 10, 15 years ago was really quite concerning because actually there were well, there was a whole prolific thing. There were N Power adverts where people were joking about how you wouldn't want to have red hair. There were there was a there were Christmas cards that were being sold in Asda with saying things like "At least you're not ginger," um, and there there certainly was a lot of abuse, but particularly for young men with red hair, and it was really really not a great time. But actually, in the last ten years, so when I was starting to think about this it has really had a bit of a renaissance again um I think you know partly Prince Harry was a you know raised profile and things we've got Harry Potter although there's a lot of redheads and they cover pretty much every stereotype in Harry Potter um but Ron isn't necessarily the best role model you know he is a little bit of a wimp a clown I mean him and the twins are quite clownish um so they, there are some of those stereotypes in there. Obviously the females, you've got Lily and people that are you know, strong characters, but it's a little bit more mixed. But then I think Ed Sheeran actually sealed the deal for um, redheaded men because he became so po worldwide popular. I think it has really raised the profile. And certainly I don't see teenagers in the same way with the same amount of abuse that I think 10 years ago redheaded men were having. So maybe there's a whole new section of redheaded history that's going to be written. Um, so thanks to it, thanks Ed Sheeran. So in pretty much in conclusion, I was sort of saying about the fact that actually you spent so much time looking for identity. There are a huge number of redheads in history. Um, if you think about obviously Western history, you've got to bear that in mind because when we look at the um, the prevalence but if you have a dot if you're um in an area or a continent where the dominant cut the dominant hair color is black or brown you know red hair is not going to be pro prolific there anyway um but if you look at the western culture there is there's a mass of redheads famous redheads um and if you think about it in terms of two percent of the population or even four percent if you're thinking about the uk about 30% of all famous people or in Western history were redheads or they came from redheaded families and they have those links. So it's, it's an interesting thing. So maybe if you are in a minor minority and you have to sort of find your identity, that identity might be more high profile in the end. 
And then again, it might be that you just have your little moment of five minutes or 10 minutes to talk about it for one night on nerd night. So <laughs> that, that's, that's the end of my talk. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. That was um, that was really fascinating, and um, and I can't believe that you're diminishing the fame of being a nerd night speaker. Like, <laughs> celebrate this moment. You're you're part of a storied and illustrious uh, heritage now. Um, uh, yeah, I like some of those people. Uh, there's a bit of um, comment in the chat in this in this montage of, of gingers as to some of us relatively surprised by some of the people in there. So, Churchill was a redhead. Yes, he was. He's, if you Go to Blenheim Palace. There is a lock of his red childhood red hair um, on display there. So yes, he's a definite redhead. And this probably isn't necessarily the message that you were looking to communicate from your talk. Um, but my brother is uh, very, very ginger. He's my older brother, so maybe it's fine that I was bullying him, you know, punching up. Um, but if I'd known all of those amazing facts about the ways that the redheads used to be persecuted in the past, I mean, I could have bullied him much more effectively, uh, but that probably wasn't the what you were looking for in terms of an outcome from your talk. So, um, uh, yes, no, he did have a, a very tough time, but his his son is like a little mini me of him and is, is bright, bright ginger and doesn't so far appear to have had the same um, level of teasing for it. He's really proud of it. He loves his red hair. Um, Evie, you've been keeping an eye on the WhatsApp chat. Um, have you got any questions for Susie coming through from that? We have loads of questions um, and I will be very, very selfish and I'll start with one from me. And that is in my uh, native language, which is Czech, um, we have a specific word for redhead people. Um, so we, we don't say they had their hair is red or ginger, describe it by another word, but there is a word specifically for that. Does that mean we have a higher prevalence or are we just, uh, is the language uh, richer or why would that be? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there, it's an interesting, in East, Eastern Europe, there are pockets um, of red hair in all over Europe, um, but the biggest population is in the UK. So I, yeah, I mean, I guess we have that for, in English, blonde isn't used for many things apart from mm. hair colour, is it? Or ginger is ubiquitous. Anyway, Evie, you have another right. question. Uh, next question is, is the same genetic mutation that often leads to freckles and pale skin along with ginger hair, or is that a different genetic trait? Okay, this is a science question, but I believe <laughs> that it's a, it's, a different, it's a different trait, but it, they go together. So I think the mutation, the mutations are separate mutations, but someone else might be able to put that in the chat and answer it properly. And <laughs> uh, another one is, uh, why do some men with dark hair have ginger moustaches and beards? That's interesting because my brother does have a big ginger patch. So um, I think I think it is to do with that presumably carrying the gene, but that is another science question that I will not say that I know the answer to because I'm sure someone else does so it would be embarrassing. <laughs> Next question is did it used to be more than two percent in in other words is is uh, the trait depleting are we getting fewer and fewer people with red hair? So I don't know exactly because um this statistic has been sort of banded around in recent history and I'm not sure whether anyone had kept track of that um, but there are often sort of things about the fact that um, the population is more likely to die down, die out um, because we've moved around and we've got different um, different care colours sort of mixing together much more. Um, certainly, if you look at sort of Scotland and Ireland, where you've got a higher population with red hair, you've got that it's much more um, stable sort of in terms of that, that numbers stayed the same because there's a lot, a lot of people. There's a lot of people that will be carrying the genes. I should imagine. Uh, and next one is um, Scots and Eastern European Jews seem to have a high incidence of redheads, but are stereotypically seen as communities with dark hair. Is there a correlation? There is a particular. It's a different. It's a slightly different. It's a color. A particular color actually that is quite closely linked to those sort of communities. But yes, there are. Um, 
there is that Jewish connotation. And so also that has fed through with the things that I was talking about, that there is this Jewish group as well that has, has got that in their genes. Next one is, is there an official scale for the redness of one's hair? So, uh... Well, I don't think there's an official one, but I did see someone that had done a science experiment and they were trying to look at like the grades of it. And I think they did a test where they put light through to see like how much, I don't know, like, it's another science thing. So I don't want to say anything because I know there'll be people that can know more about it, but they, they did something like that to sort of look at the wave spectrum or something that passed through. But there's no official thing I know. Mostly, I think people in this country, it's kind of auburn, ginger, strawberry, blonde would be the sort of scale that you go down. Mm. And you find yourself, one of the things I found as I've got older, the joy is that you actually start going further down that track. So I'm heading towards strawberry, blonde. Someone even sort of called me that the other day. As you, instead of going grey, you just sort of fade away a bit. So I'm fading slightly. <laughs> Another question is, do gingers have thinner or fewer hair? So there's so many things that are really conflicting about like some of the things you read. I read somewhere that they have a ten, ginger hair tends to be fine hair, but you tend to have thicker fine hair. So that, that was one of the things, but I don't know. So yeah, a lot more of it, but fine hair. There are two questions that uh, have been answered in the, in the chat, oh, but perfect. I'll let you weigh in because they're in. So um, it, if uh, Eve became redheaded when she ate the apple, why aren't we all redheaded? That's a really good question. Because also, like they, they were at the beginning in those genes, you know, you've got Cain, you've got lots of, their descendants had red hair, but presumably they, you know, God didn't want too many sinful people. So sort of died it out a little bit. And then th there was a question that has been uh, busted, and that is, uh, do, uh, do ginger people have lower pain thresholds? So that's an interesting one as well. So there's a lot of, there's a few things. I think if you've got red hair, quite, I've been told that by medical professionals, that they require more anesthetic, that they, um, but then there's conflicting things. So some people said they've got higher pain thresholds, some people say lower. Also, I've been told that we redheads bleed more but I think when you actually look at it it's quite anecdotal I think there was some potentially some truth about more anesthetic but there's no real understanding of that so there's that it's quite confusing there's a few things that um there's no concrete evidence either way really and the last one that we have for you is how do you think being a red-haired woman shaped you uh into the woman that you are today I think it's quite it's been quite a big bit of who I am because I think um I had to get kind of used to standing out and um yeah and I, it looked like sort of being able to answer back and have a bit of confidence I think in yourself and I think but I think being a woman it was a lot easier because you get compliments at the same time as you get the abuse so it kind of balances it out I think it would have really it would be much worse for men um particularly like 20 30 years ago when you know when I was bullying my brother. Yeah, basically, yes. <laughs> Didn't like to say, but... <laughs> yes. I do apologise to him sometimes. I tease him about different things now. Though. Thank you very much, Evie. Um, and thank you very much, Susie. If you were in the backyard bar, if we were in the backyard bar, there would be a very loud round of applause now. But we are here. You're in your living room. 